So I was hoping for a real fire, but. Yeah, well, we'll do a fireless fireside chat. Um, I know that you've spent a varied career in, in different parts of data sciences. Uh, you've been a statistics professor, you've been a quant, you've been in startups. So you've spent a lot of time thinking about the skill set that a data scientist needs. What are the basic things they need to come out of university knowing? So the thing about growing a data scientist in the, in the side academics is that right now it's not working. That's not happening. Um, and there's various reasons it's not happening. One of them is that people typically either study statistics or they study um, machine learning. And there's different problems with those different disciplines. So for example, um, in statistics, one of the problems is that the data sets that are given to you when you're a student at, in statistics are already very clean. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the way data scientists work in the real world. So when you go, if you're an actual data scientist in this industry, you, you spend 95% of your time cleaning up data or collecting it, parsing it, cleaning it up, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and that's a skill that you absolutely need um, to, to acquire. I think that that's less of a problem if you're studying machine learning, because I think, um, and it's really not that big a problem anyway. It's something that we can overcome if we want to do data science in academics, because after all, there's lots of data available on the web, and there's lots of tools to collect data on the web. But I guess that's what I'm, one of the things that a data science uh, discipline inside academics would have to do is learn how to, to to train all of its students, not, not only some of them, all of its students in that kind of collecting of the data and cleaning of the data mm -hmm. problem. And right now, you're only seeing that ha about half the time. Now, that's not the only problem, because, and it, that's a solvable problem. I think the real problem, um, for, like the biggest problem for me, is that as a data scientist, your job isn't just to collect data, clean it, and then put an algorithm, slap an algorithm on top, and then communicate it to uh, business people. That's already a lot of work, but that's not what the hard part is. The hard part, in my opinion, is figuring out what the question should be. Right. And in particular, listening to the business questions and then deciding what the real question should be. Mm. So we have a, a lot of translation problems. And that, I think, is um, that's going to be a real challenge to put that into a data science institute to get, um, because, th yeah, because Right now, the questions in both machine learning and statistics and the other fields going into the data science world the, um, coming out of academics is that all the questions that their students are trained on are well-defined right. going in. So They have um, strong signals in the data because it's so clean when they get it. So how do you do feature selection in the real world when you have weak signals? And right, right. And yeah, feature selection is a really, uh, it's a, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> um, I feel like feature selection algorithms that you learn in, um, in machine learning classes, they're good f if you don't have a domain expert sitting next to you. Right. But if you have someone, if you're in advertising, which I worked for, I worked in internet advertising for a year and a half, if, you know, why would I do a feature selection data um, a, a approach, mining approach, when I have someone who's been working in advertising for 20 years sitting next to me. Mm -hmm. I should just interview that person. Mm -hmm. and, and, and why, you know, so, and the, the real question though, like, is what the question should be, the underlying question, and that's going to be really difficult to train. It, yeah. So if we need to change all, all of these things about the way the data science is taught, or uh, that these types of skills are, are currently taught in academia. Do we need professors with different kinds of backgrounds? Is it something, where does the change need to happen? Right, so first of all, a data science, any kind of data science, um, you know, in academic, any kind of institute or department has to be interdisciplinary. It simply can't be grown out of only engineering or only statistics or only business. It has to, be, and by the way, I'm going to throw in law. Like you, you need all of that um, together. That's uh, that's already a problem because many. Uh, I've, I've been talking to universities, various universities are interested in this kind of stuff, and they have so much politics. So that's already like a political barrier. Um, that's one problem. Um, on the f flip side, the, um, there's a kind of my my belief is that modeling is a kind of a it's a craft. Yeah. That that you. As a, as, a, as a young or junior modeler, you're kind of an apprentice to a master, and, and it works well if that's a good relationship, and that's, that's the way you learn the craft. 
And I was lucky enough to be working with a master at D.E. Shaw when I was a quant there. Um, and I think that that translates pretty well into academics because you have the PhD thesis advisor and you have the student. So if, if it's a PhD program, I think that translates pretty well. What I think is much more of an obstacle is um, you know, the master has to be a master in the cutting edge technology, the stuff that's actually going on in the real world. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like that is true so much in the typical academic setting. Um, obviously there are exceptions, but it's, it's tempting when, an, when a university wants to develop a data science department or institute, it's tempting for them just to take a bunch of their favorite professors from their, from their favorite departments right. and rebrand them as data scientists. Mm -hmm. um, that's not going to work, right? You, I mean, that would be nice, but that's not what data science is. That's something else. It's some kind of inter interdisciplinary thing. If they really want cutting edge data science, they have to grab people from industry who are actually doing the stuff in the trenches. And what, what's wrong with that is, just knowing, again, going back to the politics, they know, um, the, the credentialing system inside academics is very complicated. I know because I was a math professor. Um, it's very difficult for people to think outside that, that structure, which is very rigid and very, like, which journals, how many papers, how many citations. Like, they have their own models for what, what means that you're good. And the very people they should be trying to attract from Google or you know, Facebook to, to come in and discuss what the cutting edge stuff is are not gonna be publishing papers. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how are they going to open up their minds to finding the people that they need to find to be able to be the masters? Well, with alternative education models like Coursera and Udacity, why do this inside traditional academia at all? Are there benefits to doing it inside a traditional institution? Well, first of all, those things are great and they are going to be used and there's going to be whole swaths of people that learn way more about this stuff than they ever could have in the past. Mm -hmm. But I do think that apprentice-master relationship is a special one and I don't think you can, like, um, you can really have that close relationship um, unless you actually have lots of contact. And I'm not saying it has to be in the same room, mm -hmm. but it certainly helps. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you don't know if the person is like, ready to talk to you, and you're ending up sending them email and getting it back three days later rather than just saying, hey, what about this? Yeah. So I think there is a kind of um, vicinity issue there. And you were saying that maybe one of the benefits of, of traditional academia is the ability to address the ethics question. Yeah. That, right? So here's the thing. In, in spite of all the things I just said won't work about this, mm -hmm. I think it has to happen. It has to happen. And one of the main reasons is that there's lots of cultural effects of our models um, that nobody is going, no, no given company is going to benefit from researching, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's kind of like insurance companies, each insurance company, if you're doing health insurance, if I'm an insurance company, I'm never gonna want to insure people that are really sick, right? But that doesn't mean as a society, we don't want insurance for people who are sick, right? right? So the same kind of thing with modeling, there's, um, there's plenty of ethical effect, unethical effects mm -hmm. of our models. Our models are scalable and they get scaled within days, if not hours, if they're successful in, um, in the entire world. We, if we have a shitty model, then it, ha it affects the entire world. Mm -hmm. um, and who's going to pay for thinking about that? Who, where is there going to be um, an institute that um, actually cares about the effects, tries to quantify those effects, and tries to tries to actually stop us from doing stuff that's even worse for the world. Right. So bottom line, if you're the doctor and you're writing the prescription for academia, how, what's the prescription? How do they produce solid data scientists? Bottom line. Bottom line is uh, think more broadly about what credentials mean. Make sure you're doing cutting edge stuff. You have to do it and make sure you, you encourage not just people in science, um, statistics, math, and physics, and applied math, but also people in law, policy makers, mm -hmm. about privacy issues, and ethicists, and get together and do your best. Mm. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.